This is a common sound and sight on any given day in Bermudan Landing. The people of that community decided back in 1985 that they would sacrifice portions of their privately owned land to what is now the community Baboon Sanctuary. Research had started back in 1981 by Dr. Robert Horridge, who had actually been studying the monkeys in Mexico but had a hard time finding monkeys on a regular basis. And so he eventually came over to Belize, to this village, um, specifically Bermuda Landing. Um, and he started to wander around on people's property. And it so happened that he ventured on my father's property. And that's how my family got involved. Um, and so from 81, le leading up to, to 85, they did research on collecting um, data on monkeys, how much monkeys we had, the health of the monkeys, and so forth. Um, and then they really found out that we had some healthy black howler monkeys and they wanted to do, to do something to protect these howler monkeys and so that's how they, the idea of creating a sanctuary came about. After 12 of the landowners signed an agreement to voluntarily give up some of their lands where the monkeys occupied, it made Belize the first country in the world to have a voluntary agreement by villagers who gave up land as a sanctuary to protect howler monkeys. Conway Young is the administrative and program officer at the community Baboon Sanctuary in Bermudan Landing. He explained that the villagers also decided to engage in livelihoods that do not infringe upon the survival of the monkeys in order to have them around for future generations. Elvis Samuels is one of those villagers who agrees that the howler monkeys ought to remain a part of the village, so protecting their natural habitat is a must. Samuels and Jonathan Madrill sell their artwork to visitors at the Community Baboon Sanctuary Museum in the village. Most of my pieces are considered wildlife. After all, we're at the Baboon Sanctuary where nobody's going to see whales or dolphins and sharks. Yeah. So we try primarily to keep it within the confines of product from the jungle. Mm -hmm. And the thing is, our main clientele that we are desperately waiting for is people from the cruise ships. Mm -hmm. We've been down for the past four or five months. And um, when these people come, they're not afforded a lot of time, but they get to see our wear. In my case in particular, I try to carve right on the spot. I paint monkeys because we want to protect the monkeys. You don't have to um, cut down the land and the trees. Yeah, you don't have to cut down trees. So... I paint the monkeys. Okay. Have yeah. you have you had close encounters with these gentle animals? Sure. Tell us what it looks like. Yeah, they are nice, like hum like a human being. The guides they would argue to the tourists. They would let them know, or visitors, of course, they let them know. These guys selling here prevent them from going into the bushes and cutting down the trees. I've never done that before. I usually rely on the woodcutter to bring for me. As a matter of fact, there are people who have said to me. Are you in any way depleting the rainforest? And, and that's not the case in my case, because even the smallest pieces that I can use, I use for firewood for my fire heart. Okay. And I try, to, I try to work certain pieces that contains, and i able to stretch the wood to its entirety, okay. and it lasts a little longer. Since the sanctuary was established, it has been a productive few decades for the howler monkeys. The population of these creatures has multiplied from 800 to around 4,500, enough that some of them were relocated to other parts of the country where their numbers have also reportedly grown. All the monkeys are out in the forest. So what we do is try to keep the forest connected. So keep, keep that corridor and connectivity. Because if there is breakage in the forest, then the monkeys put themselves at threat because then they have to come on the ground to get from point A to B. So by maintaining the forest um, linkage, then the monkeys can move freely. Mm -hmm. So what we do is that we, we do replanting of trees, we advocate for the, the um, keeping the forest intact. Mm -hmm. But not only that, we realize that f in, in order for the sanctuary to be successful, we also have to look at the people side of it. And so we do a, a lot of what you call um, 
livelihood projects where the, the local people can do small projects, backyard projects like fish farming, um, chicken rearing, pig rearing, organically grown gardens. And that way now the, it reduces the stress on the forest. Because if these people are not making an income from those backyard projects, more than likely some of them would have hunted or do what we call slash and burn out in the forest, which then has a negative effect on the forest. So by giving them the backyard projects where they can realize some economic benefits, it lessens the stress on the, on the environment that the monkeys need. But why is the sanctuary called a baboon sanctuary if we're talking about howler monkeys? Young explains that it's a tradition that dates back to the first slaves that arrived in the area. We don't have baboons in Belize. Uh. It was the early settlers, right, African slaves, so our ancestors who call them baboons because when they okay. they knew baboons back home so when they came to this part of the world and they saw the monkeys up in the trees the only thing they could compare it to were baboons so they call it baboons so anywhere you go in the country people say baboon first but these are actually black howler monkeys black howler monkeys are only found in three countries in this region southern mexico eastern guatemala and belize reporting for news 5 i'm marion ali